let me thank uh, Dumit and his colleagues for inviting me uh, again. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, I think last time when I spoke to you, I made the case that uh, the macroeconomic stabilization of the economy was progressing quite steadily. Now, the theme I have been given is macroeconomic turbulence and the financial sector. So I'm, <laughs> what I'm proposing to talk to you about is in the first part of my remarks, I'm going to set out some facts and let you decide whether there is serious macroeconomic turbulence or not. And then I'll talk to you a little bit about the state of the financial sector. So are we in the midst of serious? And in, on macroeconomic turbulence, I will divide it up into a domestic and and international uh, uh, trends. Domestically, are we in the midst of macroeconomic turbulence? So let me go through, uh, first, the macro policy making and two various macro indicators, and then let you judge. On policy making, as you know, the main source of instability in the system for the last 20, 30 years has been the government's fiscal operations. So has there been a major slippage in fiscal policy in recent times? Difficult to argue that. The budget deficit this year is going to be 5.3% of GDP. That's higher than the target of 48 but it's almost entirely due to flood and uh, largely, more, more importantly, drought relief. In fact, the IMF has given us the space to end up with 53 because they've realized that this relief had to be accommodated. And the government of his, of course, got through the New England Revenue Act. They've increased VAT and re removed sensitive uh, incentives. The fuel adjustment formula has been adjusted. Very difficult to argue that there has been major slippage in fiscal policy. And last year, for the first, second time in 54 years, there was a surplus in the primary balance of the budget. And it's likely that we will have one this year as well. So a structural improvement in the fiscal operations of the government. Of course, the government has to stay on course. In this lead up to the elections, they have to stay on course and that fiscal discipline has to be continued because if it's not, then all bets are off. But up to now, they're difficult to argue that there has been slippage on the fiscal side. What about the monetary side? On the monetary side, um, uh, if anything, one could argue that the central bank has been conservative. If you look at nominal and real interest rates, they're pretty high. Um, we have, we loosen the upper band of the interest rate, policy interest rate corridor by 25 basis points in April to signal that there has been a shift from a tightening to a neutral um, stance. But I don't think by any stretch of the imagination can one argue that there has been a slippage in monetary policy. In fact, some people have argued that we should have increased rates to defend the rate. I will come to that later. I will say something about exchange rate policy later on. But by and large, I don't think it's difficult to argue that there has been major slippage uh, in monetary policy, which has led to an overheating of the economy. So as far as macro, and I'll talk about the exchange rate later. So broadly, in terms of macro policy uh, making, I don't think it's possible to make the case. There have been, there's been major slippage. So let me now move to macroeconomic indicators one by one. Growth. Growth is clearly inadequate. Growth uh, last year was 3.3%. First half of 2018, 36 Second quarter, 37 and the central bank is saying that growth will be 4% this year. The IMF, ADB, et cetera, shade under that. They're at 3.7, 3.8%. So while growth is too low, it is actually on an upward trend. So there are no signs of collapse of the economy. Not enough growth, but an up, upward trend. We need to get growth up. The structural reforms need to be persisted with. But there are signs that they're beginning to take hold. We had record FDI last year, and this year is going to be significantly higher. Exports are going to be a record last year, and it's going to be higher this year. I saw um, the chairman of the EDB saying that she's confident about hitting the targets in the national export strategy. So things are going in the right direction. 
probably not fast enough, certainly not fast enough, but it's either it, steady upward uh, movement from a low base, albeit. But no signs of collapse or, or, or major turbulence. What about inflation? Inflation is well within our target range. In fact, at the bottom of our target range, the NCPI number, I think, will come out today or tomorrow. Um, the, the headline rate is actually 0.9. Uh, the, 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 the core inflation is about 4%. If you look at the CCPI, headline is about 4.3%. Core is 2 point something. So inflation is well contained, um, significantly due to food prices and the base effects of high inflation in the second half of last year, particularly the fourth quarter. So you can't say that there is massive overheating of the economy and inflation is rampant. Far from that. Inflation is uh, well within the target. So no signs of macroeconomic turbulence if you look at inflation. Uh, what, what about the, uh, so let me also say on interest rates, um, before I get there, let me, let me uh, say uh, monetary aggregates, credit growth, all of those are well contained. I mean, this is to see whether there's overheating in the economy. M2B uh, in August went up by 13.5%, credit to private sector by 14.3%. So no real signs of overheating and within what we are comfortable with at the central bank. Um, treasury bill rate, the one-year treasury bill rate at the last auction was 10.44. It having dipped, it has gone up recently. But let me give you the rates in previous years. If you look at this century, 2000, 18.22. 2007, 19.96. This is a one-year treasury bill rate. 2000, 18.22. 2007, 19.96. 2008, 19.12, 2012, 11.69. And as I said, at the last auction, it was 10.44. So the economy has had much higher one-year treasury bill rates and has not collapsed. And so uh, while we would like it to be lower, uh, it's not, you can't argue that uh, there is massive turbulence uh, being reflected in the uh, treasury bill market. What about the external sector? The current account deficit this year is going to be 3% of GDP. It's a bit higher than we anticipated uh, because of three things, gold imports, but those have been dealt with now. The arbitrage opportunity through the duty differential between uh, uh, India and Sri Lanka has been, has been now eliminated and gold imports have come down. The second thing is, is uh, motor vehicles. Again, the duty structure and very cheap petroleum if I, I would actually, you guys who are doing analysis, should publish the daily petroleum price in India, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka. These, Bangladesh has a per capita income, I don't know, significantly lower than us. You should put their petroleum products prices and compare them with ours. Uh, so you'll see that clearly cheap petroleum also contributed to the motor vehicle imports. Now we have the formula and there has been uh, some duty change, plus the margins uh, that the central bank has imposed uh, on LCs for motor vehicles. All that, we hope, will be uh, sufficient remedial action to um, address the sharp increase in uh, motor vehicles, which was the second cause uh, of the, uh, the major deterioration in the trade account, which has fed through into the current account deficit. And the third thing, of course, is oil, over which we have no control. So the current account deficit is 3% of GDP or a little bit more. That's what's anticipated this year. Let me give you some numbers from this century. 2000, 6.4. 2006, 5.3. 2008, 9.5. 2011, 7.1. 2012, 5.8. And we are anticipating it'll be 3%. Again, no signs of major turbulence or an impending collapse of the economy. So, what about reserves? Reserves are currently about 8 billion USD, uh, which is a shade under five months of import cover. Um, and um, it's, it's been significantly lower in the past. Uh, we feel that this is an area we need to focus uh, in a very concerted way. Uh, the Active Liability Management Act 
which was passed in April, has given us new flexibility. Um, I hope when Parliament sits later this week, they will approve a resolution that has been presented to them, which will enable um, the government of Sri Lanka to raise up to 310 billion rupees over and above what is uh, required for the government's borrowing requirement this year to, for liability management purposes. And that will give us the headroom to aggressively build buffers to address in particular the external uh, financing requirements that are coming up ahead of us. So what we have in it, we've got a billion dollars in this year, uh, just uh, last week from the China Development Bank on very favorable terms. That was part of this year's borrowing requirement. That can be upscaled to 500 million under the Active Liability Management Act. We are exploring Samurai and, and Panda bond, Sukuk bonds. We are, we are in the midst of talks with the Central Bank of Oman and the Central Bank of Qatar for swap arrangements. Um, we will uh, go into the market for an ISB uh, relatively quickly as well. So all this is lined up. So there is two, three billion dollars worth of uh, resource mobilization um, that the uh, uh, government and the central bank are planning uh, to uh, raise. Uh, and we are confident with that, that we have the firepower to meet our external debt obligations. Sri Lanka has never missed a single payment and that is not something we want to allow to change, and, and also to have some money in the turbulence uh, EM space as far as exchanges uh, rate is concerned, to have some money to prevent a disorderly adjustment of the exchange rate. As I said, I'll talk about the exchange rate a bit more later. So if one looks at each of these macroeconomic indicators, they could be better, for sure, but there are no signs of major turbulence. Uh, and uh, certainly uh, impending collapse is, is difficult. That argument is difficult to sustain. Let me just focus a little bit on the exchange rate because that's been very topical recently. Uh, the ex uh, Sri Lanka rupee has depreciated by about 10.8% so far this year. It's been a part of an emerging market uh, phenomenon, as you all know. Uh, I mean, the, the, the Indonesian rupiah has depreciated by a similar amount. The Indian rupee has depreciated by, uh, by, by 12%. Uh, now, in Sri Lanka, we think the currency uh, and the fate of the currency is a reflection of the fate of the economy. That if the currency depreciates, that the uh, economy is about to collapse. But let me, you look at the Indian situation. Their currency has depreciated more than 12%. Ours is 10, a little over 10. But India has reserves of 400 billion US dollars. The Indian economy in the second quarter grew by 8%. So there is, you know, that economy is not collapsing, <laughs> but the currency has depreciated by 12%. So one needs to try to understand what is really happening in terms of the market dynamics in the FX space, and then you know, as I said, you look at our macroeconomic indicators. They could be better. I'm the first to say they can, they can be better. We should not be a twin deficit country. We have to get out of that basket. All that is true. But things have been worse, and we haven't collapsed. And I do feel they are, while things are not as good as they should be, that we are, there is no impending collapse or major turbulence. So to can continue with the exchange rate story, it has been said that, you know, on whether the uh, economy, because the rate has, rate has depreciated, is, is in a terrible, parlous condition. As I said, India, 8% growth, 400 billion reserves, depreciated, 12%. Indonesia, again, has very healthy reserve, I think about 200 billion. Uh, growth has been 4 5%, depreciated by 10%, uh, like us. So that relationship needs to be better understood. And, and it's also been said that, you know, uh, that the, the Ethiopian economy, the Zimbabwean economy, the Bangladesh economy, those currencies have depreciated much less than us. That is actually a rather mischievous statement because those economies are all low-income countries and have little or no exposure to capital markets. When we were a low-income country in 1997, 
and had no exposure to capital markets, we were not affected by the Asian financial crisis. Korea was, Thailand was, Malaysia was, we were not. But nobody in their right senses would say that our economy was stronger than Korea, Thailand, and Malaysia in 1997. So, because now we are a lower middle income country, we have exposure to rating agencies and capital markets. So when there is an exogenous shock in our cap through the capital markets, we experience it. Bangladesh is no exposure. It's a low income country. It's a lot of foreign aid. Its external financing is met almost entirely by foreign aid. Ethiopia, the same. Zimbabwe, the same. So to compare those countries with Sri Lanka clearly uh, is misleading. Um, then, uh, but we, we also think that, and there's also been uh, an allegation when I uh, come to the banking sector, I'll develop this more, but there's been an allegation that, uh, that mismanagement has put the banking sector at risk. And that during the global financial crisis, things were managed extremely well and the banking sector was not affected. Uh, I'm not sure how much management was necessary because Sri Lankan banks were not exposed to the banks that collapsed or had serious difficulties in 2008. So one didn't have to do very much to protect the financial system uh, if we don't have uh, exposure uh, to those uh, financial institutions which had difficulty. And it's also difficult to argue that there was no problems in the financial system. Uh, the biggest headache, I see the direct non-bank financial supervision sitting directly in front of me. The biggest nightmares I've had in the two years and three months I've been in office have not been at, in relation to the bond issuances, which they were pretty nightmarish, but not the worst, not the misuse of the superannuation fund of the people, working people of this country, which is the EPF, but the problems in the non-bank financial institution sector. The sector as a whole is okay, but there was a legacy of six insolvent companies that has been passed down to me, and nothing has been done about them, and it's a major, major problem. And it was due to, we live in a very politicized society, and it was due to regulatory forbearance related to the politicization of our society. And that politics had seeped into the central bank. So you can't say that the financial sector was managed extremely well. Because this is the biggest problem. This is the thing that gives me the biggest nightmares as to how we're going to handle this. We will handle it. We've got a game plan. And we are quietly working our way through it. Mr. Ranavira and his team have done a tremendous amount of work. But it is a big challenge. So nobody can say that the financial system was managed extremely well and that we had no problems in previous years. Um, then, um, <clears throat> so let me uh, now uh, talk a little bit about uh, actually what have been the dynamics in the exchange rate FX market. Why has there been pressure? some domestic factors and some external factors. What are the domestic factors? As I said earlier, there was the arbitrage opportunity for gold and a spike in gold imports. And the motor vehicle imports for the reasons that I gave and the oil prices. So there has been a, uh, a demand for foreign exchange um, and there's been a spike in demand for foreign exchange in these three uh, sectors, in these three products uh, which, have, which have brought pressure on the demand side. Uh, oil, of course, is the price effects. Then, of course, when you see pressure in the exchange rate market, export conversions get delayed. Importers advance their imports, particularly as we were about to move into the kind of season where there is a spike in imports anyway. So some of those importers, I think, have advanced their purchases. So all that meant that there has been a spike in demand, which has brought about uh, 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 brought about uh, additional demand. And of course, like in other countries, with the normalization of US interest rates, there has been an outflow of money from, uh, the outflow of FII from the government securities market. About 
600 million has gone out since April. So that has also put pressure on the exchange rate. Now, what about the prospects? Are we going to be able to stabilize it? The central bank, uh, we've learned lessons from the episodes in 2011, 12, and 2015. You will recall that in 2011 and 12, we spent 4 billion US dollars of our reserves and ended up by depreciating the currency by something like 14.9% anyway. In 2015, I mean, these are done by all governments. I'm not trying to make a partisan point here. 2015, this government spent $3 billion and then had to, uh, of, of our reserves, and then had to depreciate by 10%. So, um, you know, that is a lesson we need to learn, that expending large amounts of our reserve to defend a particular rate does not work, and you end up depreciating anyway. So this time around, the central bank has allowed the rate to depreciate, but to do so in as orderly a fashion as possible. And we have used some of our reserves to defend the rate, from, to prevent it, prevent us from having a disorderly adjustment of the exchange rate. Uh, we, on a net basis, we've now spent about 360 or 370 million. Uh, and this is what we plan to do. But is the pressure likely to come off? Well, one could cautiously argue that it could well, for the following reasons. Um, towards the end of the year, there's an increase in remittance flows. So the supply of foreign exchange increases. Also, more than 50% of the tourism receipts come between November and February. So that is another source of supply into the FX market. Plus, uh, uh, the importers who would normally have imported in, in sort of the end of the year for the, for the season, we think may well have done their importing. They may have advanced their importing, uh, given the trends in the FX market. So that may take some of the pressure off on the demand side. So if you take all this together, uh, one can be reasonably hopeful that uh, the increased supply and some moderation of demand could help us to uh, have less pressure uh, in the FX market going forward. Let me say something about uh, the, the impact of the depreciation so far. Clearly, the concern people have is the impact of the depreciation of the currency on the cost of living. This has been, you know, in the past, particularly when we were importing lots of rice, people say, if you depreciate the, uh, the currency, it hits people in the stomach. But that is not the case anymore, um, at least uh, in non-drought years, because we import very little rice uh, in a normal uh, rice production year. And it, interestingly, we have been studying this very carefully as to the pass-through into the price, prices from the depreciation of the currency, which started April, but more May, June. So far, the pass-through has been fairly muted. Interestingly, local production of foodstuff has become more competitive. And so importers can't increase their price very much because there is a local supply as well. And that is having a moderating influence on, on prices. So uh, up to now, up to now, the pass-through hasn't been as much as we thought uh, it would be. Because inflation is, as you know, extremely muted at the moment. But there is no doubt that there is a high import component in our basic consumption bundle. And clearly, excessive depreciation of the currency will have an impact on the cost of living. And inflation is a highly regressive, implicit tax on the poor and vulnerable. Because rich people have assets which increase in value in high inflation, uh, in a high inflation context, and that's a hedge. But the poor don't have that hedge. So clearly, the central bank has a responsibility to make sure that there isn't excessive depreciation of the currency. But a competitive rate, the rear is now a shade under 100 helps exporters, helps import competing goods. When you have a rear of 100, you stop subsidizing foreign producers at the expense of domestic producers. So this movement of the exchange rate, I see as an opportunity, provided it's not excessive, I see as an opportunity. It's also an opportunity for us to address this 
issue where our imports are almost double our exports. So we need this kind of adjustment to bring about the transformation. That is not the exchange rate is not the only thing you need, but a competitive exchange rate is powerful. It's a powerful instrument to support our producers, exports and import competing goods. It's, all, it's also been said that the depreciation, depreciation of the currency uh, increases the burden of debt servicing. Uh, that's a partial statement in the sense that you need to look at the whole picture. One, uh, the dollar amount stays the same, right? So if you borrow a billion, you pay back a billion. What about the burden on the budget in terms of rupees? Of course, you need more rupees to pay back the debt, the foreign debt. That's one side of the ledger. On the other side, all the inflows that come into the government, the various loans, the ISBs, the term loans, the SLDBs, uh, institutional investment into the government sec, uh, market, all that, you get more rupees, right? So you have to pay more uh, rupees to service the debt, but all the inflows of uh, uh, FX into the government budget becomes more rupees. In addition, the take from import duties goes up because the rupee value of imports go up and so the collection from import duties go up. So I would run the analysts in the, I would ask the analysts in this room to run the numbers and you will see that depreciation has a net positive impact on the budget. Now you shouldn't depreciate the currency just to finance your budget deficit, but it is wrong to say that this is a problem, that if the currency depreciates, your debt servicing is going to be more burdensome. That is only looking at one side of the ledger. If you look at the whole picture, actually depreciation has a net positive impact on the government budget. So let me, uh, with that, uh, get on to the banking sector. Okay, I have uh, five minutes. Um, now, you know the structure of the banking sector. I'm not going to go into that. Uh, the banking sector accounts for 63% of the total assets of the financial sector as at end 2017. Total assets uh, amounted to rupees 11 trillion, uh, and loans and advances ac uh, accounted for 7.1 trillion. The NPL ratio has uh, gone up. Uh, it, it, the trough was 2.5% about the middle of last year, and it has gone up to 3.5%. Clearly, the slowdown in the economy, uh, three successive uh, cultivation seasons being affected by drought, all that has contributed to the rise in NPLs, and clearly banks would need to be prudent and uh, take this into account uh, in their uh, uh, risk assessments. But does that mean the financial system is on the verge of collapse? There, let me see whether I can find these numbers. In 2009, the NPLs were 8.8. .8. In 2014, NPLs were 6.2. Now they're 3.5. So again, the financial system didn't collapse in 2009, nor in 2014. So there's no reason to believe that the financial system is going to collapse now. But having said that, there's a buildup in NPLs, and both the central bank as the regulator and the banks need to be cautious. Uh, currently, the banking sector uh, maintains a return on assets of 1.9% and a return on equity of 14.5%. Uh, the banking sector has been on track to meet the requirements under Basel III, both in terms of capital and liquidity. The banking industry is maintaining a total car of 15.8% as at end August 2018. The banking industry is also maintaining adequate liquidity levels in terms of the statutory liquid asset ratio and Basel III liquid coverage ratio. The domestic banking unit SLA of the banking sector was 30% as at end August 2018 and has remained well above the minimum statutory requirement of 20%. The rupee and all, current, uh, and all currency LCR also remained at 186% and 151% respectively, well above the regulatory requirement of 90%. So, you know, uh, NPLs are increasing, but there is no sign of the banking sector being extremely vulnerable. Uh, 
digitalization in the banking sector. The banking industry in Sri Lanka is also transforming toward the digitalized era powered by innovation. Thus, digitalization has become the new normal for all banks in Sri Lanka. Uh, fully automated branches are likely to, be the likely to become reality soon, with several robots functioning with a few staff. With these developments, conventional banking would take a new shape where almost all banking transactions are carried out digitally. But this journey will not be an easy one. The benefits are potentially very substantial. They range from cost effectiveness to an enhanced customer experience. However, it is important to remember that these technological developments will not entirely eliminate the existing risks. Furthermore, there will be a new set of risks in the form of cyber threats, breaches in information security and confidentiality, increased risk of money laundering, and other risks arising from third-party dependencies. Therefore, while as the REED regulator, the CBSL welcomes the new digitalization initiatives and other advanced technological developments, a cautious uh, adoption process is recommended. Banks are urged to carry out comprehensive risk identification analysis and mitigate risk, comprehensive risk identification analysis and mitigation prior to implementation of high-tech banking solutions. Cybersecurity has become a significant risk due to the increasing volume and sophistication of cyber attacks. Failures in cybersecurity have the potential to impact operations, core processes, reputation of in in individual institutions, and in extreme cases can undermine the public's confidence in the safety of the financial services industry as a whole. All risks emanating from rapid technological change need to be addressed rigorously while embracing the opportunities created. Therefore, both banks and the regulator need to be vigilant and keep abreast of the changing technological landscape by upgrading regulatory frameworks, processes, and systems to prevent and mitigate risks, from arising, risks arising from technology. The Central Bank of Sri Lanka seeks to continuously strengthen the supervision and regulation of the banking sector in line with international standards to improve its soundness and resilience. Um, with the Central Bank issued the Basel III Capital Regulation in 2016 and Basel III Liquidity Regulations in 2015. And as I said, those ratios are in pretty good shape. With the implementation of IFRS 9, report, uh, reporting of financial assets and liabilities of all entities needed to be in line with the new accounting standard from 1st January 2018. CBSL is working with the industry to have a smooth transition in order to have a modulated impact on capital adequacy during the initial periods of the new reporting. Other measures implemented recently to strengthen the regulatory framework include regularizing foreign currency borrowing by banks, issuing directions on fin financial derivative transactions, and establishing a regulatory framework on agency banking. CBSL is in the process of amending the Banking Act with the view of strengthening the regulatory framework in consultation with the banking industry. Further, CBSL is drafting regulation to introduce a new share ownership policy, strengthening corporate governance, and broad-basing share ownership to avoid ownership concentration, reduce risks in relation to third-party uh, transactions, and strengthen fit and proper assessment criteria for directors, CEOs, and key management personnel. CBSL will continue to enhance the regulatory system based on internationally benchmark regulations and best practices to further strengthen the resilience of the financial sector uh, now, quickly, last thing, roadmap to build resilience in the wake of disruptive technologies. The, ta the challenge for the regulator is to facilitate rapid technological development while maintaining financial system stability. In this regard, and with the objective of strengthening technology resilience in the banking sector, the CBSL has developed a roadmap which has been approved by the Monetary Board. The roadmap is targeted to be completed by 2020. It includes comprehensive technology risk assessments, external confirmations of compliance with international standards, and security reviews of information communication technology infrastructure. Further awareness sessions on information security will be conducted for boards of directors and senior management, as well as training and certification programs for technology risk management staff. These will be delivered in collaboration with the Center for Banking Studies of the CBSL, the Institute of Bankers of Sri Lanka, and local universities. Also, regulations are to be introduced on a minimum number of IT staff with designated qualifications to be present in the internal audit departments. Further, CBSL is drafting regulations to mandate banks with higher inherent technology risk to establish dedicated information security operations centers or subscribe to a third-party shared ISOC. 
In addition, CBSL is in the process of establishing policy frameworks for streamlining the digitalization of banking operations and defining minimum regulatory expectations on cloud computing. As many of you are aware, the CBSL appointed two committees to promote fintech and blockchain initiatives in Sri Lanka. These committees were drawn from commercial bankers, IT professionals, and central bank staff. They're working towards possible solutions to revolutionize the current financial system and take the country's financial system to the next level. One of such major innovations in the payments industry is the implementation of a national QR code, which will gear the payment landscape of the country to be more suited for the digital era. CBSL also launched a regulatory sandbox welcoming fintech initiatives where startups will be given the opportunity to develop and test new ideas, ideas within the regulatory framework. So the banking system, um, as I said, NPLs have increased, but the, uh, the ratios are in pretty reasonable shape. Uh, they, the banking system is uh, being uh, very active in embracing new technology uh, and innovation. Uh, so it's in, all in all in, uh, I think, encouraging shape. Lots of work to be done, but there are also causes to be encouraged. So on the macro side, not good enough. Not more than a C, but no impending collapse, no major turbulence. On the banking side, again, NPLs, we need to keep an eye on them. Otherwise, there are a lot of positive signs as well. Thank you all very much.